Continuing my trawl of the internet for air sanitizing devices, electronic air sanitizing devices, I came across this one and got immediate deja vu because I bought one of these before, but I think it was decades ago. And I have a sneaky feeling, based on the construction of this and how well it's made and its functionality, this may be a Japanese design that has just got loose into the Chinese manufacturers. So uh, let's, well, let me demonstrate it. You turn it on and... If I hold it up near next to the microphone, you hear it hissing. You may even get a wee draft of air coming out of it. And this has a very potent output. As you'll see, it takes... It's not rechargeable. It, well, it, I've got rechargeable cells in it, but it takes AA cells. And here's where you're about to get the same thing as I got, probably, when I start taking this to bits, that this is not a typical Chinese design. So the bottom comes off with three screws. Everything goes together very well. The battery compartment slides on nicely. This is all clues that it was originally designed quite well. But then it gets a bit freaky. In terms of, like, the cost of construction, it makes it look as though this could be an expensive unit. It's not. It costs about £10 or probably about $12, $13 to buy one of these. So once you've got these screws out, this cover comes off, revealing... More screws. So now, I'm going to have to lift these wires up. I had a provisional exploration then stop because I've made so many videos about things like this that I've only been making videos about uh, ones that are particularly interesting. And this one is very interesting. So now these two screws come out. Let's do a screw count. So now we're up to... I'll pop that screw out there. So now we're up to five screws. And we're not even in yet. So let's take another couple of screws out. So we'll take these ones out. I'll reverse engineer this. I'll also do some current tests on it. I have a sneaky feeling that, again, it's going to win over some of the modern products that just seem to just not understand the concept of putting a processor into sleep mode. So this comes off. Right, okay. And then to get this open, now that you've taken these screws out, I think... This comes apart, does it? So this comes off. Revealing more screws. So now we're up to uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and some double sided tape. Nine. Do you think this was easy to manufacture? Probably not. 10. This must be the most screws I've ever found in a generic Chinese product, particularly of this style. So what's going to happen now? So is that the best part of a dozen screws already? Is it going to come apart now? Oh, here we go, here we go. Quite a big potted power supply. This is... Oh, blimey, look at the number of bits. Oh, there's more screws. Jeez. Right, tell you what, there's two more screws. I was so impressed, I have to say, I bought another one of these before making this video because I thought, you know, I just already, without even opening it like this fully, I'm impressed. Right, so what's going to happen now? I can see a crystal in the circuit board, which is very odd. Okay, I'm not getting anywhere here, am I? Does this clip in as well? I may come back to that. I may spudge it, in fact. But I get a feeling that it may be clipped in as well, maybe? No. It... it oh, there it goes. Huge ozone emitter. Ridiculous ozone emitter. Actually, you know what? I think I just needed to undo those clips. Unlike the standard cheap modern ones that have a single spike and just a single hole, it's this one's got a... Uh, has it got a charge? No, it's not. It's got four. And that... Uh, what this does is it puts a very high DC voltage across this. Oh, it's even got a model number in that. Uh, GH2127. 
but it applies a high voltage, DC voltage, between the back and the front, usually negative in the back, positive in the front, and that uh, doesn't just create an ionic airflow by charging the air and causing, uh, causing it to move towards the front plate and create quite a strong draft, but it also causes a corona discharge and it tips these little needles down here. Let me show you the tips of the needles. Let me bring something white in so you can see the needles. Uh, and when those uh, needles uh, are energised, you get the little purple dot in the end, the corona discharge, which is an electrical discharge, and that's creating ozone, amongst other exciting things. This is very impressive. So what's the circuit board going to be like? More bits. And more bits. Just so many bits. This is not modern Chinese design. This is nice and minimalist, though. Is it? It's a surface mount. Um, we've got a couple of buttons. We've got a capacitor uh, crystal. We've got the processor. Right, tell you what. I'm going to I'm going to do some electrical tests on this, and I'm also going to explore this, and I'll tell you what its uh, standby current and so on is like. One moment, please. The reverse engineering is complete. Quite odd bit of circuitry. And uh, the tests have been done to measure the standby current. For a start... Standby current when it's off is 0.3 microamps, which is extremely good. When it's running, it's 40 milliamps. But when it goes into standby between bursts of ozone, it alternates quite rhythmic, rhythmically between 12 and 40 microamps, but occasionally does a wee sort of 1 milliamp burst just as it flashes an LED. So on this side of the circuit board, I've not bothered flipping it, so the text is all the right way around. We simply have a capacitor um, electrolytic across the... Uh, battery supply, we have a two colour LED, we've got a crystal and we've got two buttons. That's all on this side. If we look at the other side, there's that little electrolytic capacitor just going straight across the supply rails. There are the two buttons here and there's the LED with three pins. The middle pin is negative and but then the other ones are taken positive via these two resistors. We have the crystal here has two decoupling capacitors. It's little load capacitors going to the negative rail. We've got a capacitor straight across the positive and negative decoupling capacitor for the microcontroller. We have a transistor to switch the ozone generator, which goes across these two terminals. And we have this very odd little bit of circuitry here, which I think is a voltage threshold detector. Let's cut straight to the schematic. Uh, the chip has no number. This is not a surprise. Clues... Uh, pin 1, 2, 3, pin 4 is positive, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 is negative, and most notably, 1, 2, 3, 4, pins 5 and 6 are the crystal. That's probably going to be a clue as to what that chip is. Let's bring in the schematic and analyse it. We'll zoom down on this so we can get up close and personal with it. So... <clears throat> We've got the three W batteries. There's no polarity protection, but it doesn't really... Well, it would actually matter. It would fry the chip if you put the batteries in the wrong way around, but it'll have battery compartment protection for that, probably. Let me just take a look inside. Mm, it's Usually they've got these spacers to stop you doing that. It's not so obvious here. Yes, you probably could put the batteries in the wrong way around. But the that creates a 4.5 volt rail. And we've got the electrolytic across that, plus the little decoupling capacitor, which I'll guess is 100 nanofarad, and then the my micro-ler. I should have just written MCU there. The microcontroller has the crystal going down to the negative rail with via these... Uh, it, well, the crystal's across two pins, and then it's got the uh, load capacitors to the negative rail for crystal stability to allow operation. I've got the two buttons which just pull pins directly down to the negative rail, so they'll have internal weak pull-up. We've got the two LEDs. The red one is very sensitive, the green one is not. Uh, the red one has a 3K resistor, that, but the green one has a 620 ohm resistor. Is that right? 620 ohm? Is that what I read? Yes, it is. 621, 62 and 10. And that drives... The, the next thing is a 1K resistor to this ordinary Y1 NPN transistor switches on the ozone module, which then applies the high voltage between the spikes and the rings. But across the ozone module, turned on at the same time as everything else, is what I believe is battery voltage monitoring. It's a potential divider connected to the base of a PNP transistor, a Y2. Normally that base, if it's 
uh, if the base here is pulled negative with respect to the positive rail, that's what turns it on when you reach a certain voltage threshold. So they've got a divider here that I tested the voltage and as I gradually turned the bench supply down, when I reached three volts almost on the button, this point here suddenly went from being a positive voltage, it went down to being close to the zero volt rail, well within a, a volt, It's but it suddenly dropped and that's the point the little red LED started blinking to show that the battery was low. So it does look like a potential divider measuring the voltage under load across the ozone unit, which makes sense. And only that also means that it, the voltage monitoring only gets switched on when the ozone unit's on, which means it's not normally just connected across the battery. And that's more or less it. I drew this in purple here just to show the feedback back to the microcontroller, which just, I think it's looking for a straight logic transition. It may not have the ability in that era of microcontroller if it's using one from the original era of the design, or they might have just used a cheaper microcontroller that doesn't have supply voltage monitoring facilities, so it's just using this tiny little bit of extra circuitry just to look for that voltage threshold to detect when the battery's getting too low. And they've decided three volts is enough that at that point, the ozone output is going to be depleted. Um, so overall, this little design, apart from being in like millions of pieces in this design, um, so many bits of plastic. But apart from that, I think this is an old design. And it looks so complicated that it, it really makes me think this is a Japanese product that has just got gone wild, so to speak, in the Chinese factories. Um, but uh, it seems fairly competent. The reason this wasn't coming out easily is because it was heat staked in. I didn't spot that till afterwards. There was two little uh, welds here. So they've basically, they've clipped this in under here. Uh, and then they've just heat staked that in to hold it down. So that's why it clipped out with such force when I completely annihilated those fixings. Uh, overall, it's not that expensive what it does. It seems logical circuitry. The standby current is impeccable. It means the batteries are going to have a long run time. The module looks pretty good. The GH2127 seems to be specific to this module. It When I typed that in, it just came up with pictures of this whole unit. And the fact it runs the four emitter, this thing produces a ton of ozone for, for its size. Uh, for the application, it's maybe a bit powerful for fridge. Good for cupboards or small rooms. But uh, this uh, is very impressive, little ozone module. But then again, also, it's only pulsed every so often, so it'll be putting out surges of it. A lot of the feedback I saw on this unit was that it does have a good effect in the fridge. It does keep vegetables for longer and I have to say that since I started using it the vegetables just don't seem to age because any contaminants that land the outside and then mold and cheese are killed by the ozone which is the whole point it oxidizes any contaminants but this is a very impressive unit now I'm going to stick it back together but I would say overall this is one of the most interesting I've taken to bits it seems old-fashioned but good for that it seems a pretty good design